The most commonly used whole cell assay involves the measurement of fluorescence. Though there are additional ways of making a cell fluorescent, such as using caged fluorophores and enzymes that deprotect them, the most common way of making a cell fluoresce is to express a gene encoding a fluorescent protein. There are a small number of ancestral fluorescent protein genes that have been isolated from jellyfish and other marine organisms. However, they have been extensively mutated to create additional genes with altered properties. There are many variants of GFP and RFP today with different spectral properties. For example, YFP is a mutant of GFP that emits yellow light instead of green. Also, there are mutants that fluoresce only in the presence of calcium ions. This is only the tip of the iceberg of fluorescent proteins that exist now, but the main point is that these can be expressed in many types of cells and can fluoresce at wavelengths that the cells do not normally generate. Thus, these signals can be readily quantified on intact cells using various fluorescence measurements. One workhorse instrument for measuring fluorescence is cytometry. Here, a dilute sample of cells is passed through a flow chamber. A laser is directed at a region of space along this chamber. Because the cells are dilute, only one cell passes through the laser at any given time. If that cell is fluorescent due to the expression of a fluorescent protein, the cell will emit light as it passes through the laser. The wavelength of that emitted light will be redshifted relative to the laser's wavelength, so it is easily detected. Additionally, the cell will scatter the laser light in directions other than its original vector. These signals are quantified by placing detectors at alternate angles to the incident beam. Thus, each cell gives a side scatter signal, a forward scatter signal, and one or more fluorescent signals depending on the instrument setup. Cytometers are primarily designed to work on mammalian cells, but they can also be used for bacteria or yeast cells, but the data is less precise. FACS, or Fluorescence Activated Cell Sorting, is an instrument that adds functionality to a cytometer. As the cell passes through the laser, a fax machine can deflect the cell into different collection bins based on the signals that are observed. Thus, a fax machine will sort your cells while a cytometer only takes measurements of your cells. The output of a cytometer is a list of measurement events for each cell that was detected going through the cytometer. Each event is accompanied by a forward scatter, side scatter, and fluorescence value presented as a number. It is very rare to look at the raw data from a cytometry run. There are typically 10,000 events or more in the data set, requiring the use of visualizations to be meaningful. Here is a typical series of visualizations. Panels A, B, and C are each dot plots, while D is a histogram. Each dot in the chart represents one cell that passed through the laser. In each plot, the axes are two different signals. In A, it is side scatter versus forward scatter. These scatter measurements are related to the size and shape of the cell. With mammalian cells, these signals are more clustered. For bacteria, as shown here, there is a cone of, of events primarily as a result of their smaller size, but also their rod shape. There is more surface area to scatter off of, and the bacterium passes through the laser side on rather than end on. In panel D, we have a different type of plot called a histogram. Here we plot the number of events that were observed for a narrow range of measured values. Here they are computing the distribution of red fluorescence measurements within the population. So a dot plot compares two different measurements, while a histogram shows the distribution of only one measurement. Typically, fluorescence measurements are presented on log scale due to the wide range of signals, and also the low precision of the measurements. Though the values observed during any single event have low precision, many events can be averaged together to get more confident values. Another common way of measuring fluorescence is to use microscopy. In this experiment, the engineers loosely immobilize bacteria on an agar pad on a slide. They then excite with a laser and take images or videos of fluorescence. Microscopy has lower throughput and lower precision than cytometry. However, it allows time-lapse measurements on the same population of bacteria, while cytometry only works for a single time point per cell. Like cytometry, depending on your instrument setup, you might be able to monitor multiple colors simultaneously. For larger cells, you can also monitor subcellular localization. You can also see morphological changes in the population. This allows you to correlate morphological variation with fluorescence variation. And this is information typically missed in other forms of measurement. You can track the heredity of fluorescent activity for a lineage of cells as well. I'll unpack this statement in the next slide, but like cytometry, microscopy requires normalization of signal, but not normalization of optical density. 
Suppose I use my God's eye view of what's going on in two samples of bacteria encoding RFP. On the left, the cells are much more fluorescent than those on the right. On two different days, I run one of the samples on the cytometer and collect a histogram. Surprisingly, the instrument is telling me that the cells on the right are more fluorescent than those on the left. The problem here is that the sensitivity of the instrument will drift over time. There are dials you can tune that can make the sample be any number you want it to be. Thus, you must in some way standardize the signal to get consistent measurements across experiments. For cytometry, this normalization is typically done by comparison to cells that lack the fluorophore, such as unmodified bacteria grown under similar conditions to the test samples. You run the white cells through the cytometer, then adjust the gain on the instrument such that the signal is centered in the first decade. You then measure your test samples with these settings. Though this does not involve fluorescence, another means of using light to make measurements on a cell is to use spectroscopy. Here you hit a sample with a beam of light and quantify how much comes out the other end. That is its transmittance, which is inversely related to absorbance. This measurement requires the use of a chromophore, which means a molecule that absorbs light. A very common fluorophore for such experiments is orthonitrophenol, which turns yellow. Cells don't absorb much yellow light, thus there is little competing signal at this wavelength. Typically, orthonitrophenol will be caged with another molecule like phosphate or galactose that prevents the molecule from absorbing light. An enzyme like alkaline phosphatase or galactosidase can release the alcohol and color results. Thus, the activity of the enzyme in the cell can be monitored by watching the formation of yellow color. Scattering is a related phenomenon in which light bounces off a particle at a different angle than its incident vector. Experimentally, scattering is measured the same way as absorbance, though it is a distinct phenomenon. In spectrometric measurements of cells, the scattering signal will be superimposed over the absorbance signal, and the two signals are additive. The scattering signal can be isolated by monitoring the cells at 600 nanometers, and this is referred to as the sample's optical density. It is linearly related to the concentration of cells in the sample. Fluorimetry is highly related to spectroscopy, and fluorimeter can also perform absorbance measurements, thus you only need one instrument to do both techniques. In spectroscopy, we hit with one wavelength and monitor the amount of light coming through the sample. In fluorimetry, we hit with one wavelength and monitor the light emitted at 90 degree angles to the incident beam and at a higher wavelength. Thus, there is an excitation wavelength at which we probe the sample, and an emission wavelength at which we observe the response. Such experiments require the presence of a small molecule fluorophore or a fluorescent protein. Like chromophores, these molecules absorb light. However, instead of simply irradiating heat in response, these molecules release the energy as photons at a higher wavelength. Cells contain some mildly fluorescent fluorophores, such as tryptophan, which produces a background signal in these measurements. This autofluorescence background can mask low signals. Like cytometry and microscopy, you must normalize the signal against some standards such as white cells in fluorimetry and spectrometry. Additionally, you must normalize for cell density. Consider I have these two samples containing the same bacteria. The only difference is that the cells on the left are twice as concentrated as those on the right. Fluorescence measurements are linearly related to concentration, thus the sample on the left will give twice the signal as those on the right. If you take those numbers at face value, you would incorrectly conclude that the cells on the left are more fluorescent than those on the right. So you must normalize for cell density. This is most easily done by measuring the optical density, or OD, which is the absorbance at 600 nanometers caused by scattering. That signal is linearly related to the concentration of the cells. Thus, the ratio of these two values will reflect the per cell fluorescence, and in this case, we get numbers that are much more similar as we would expect by looking at it with our eyes.